Uh, whew, I'm already out of breath. <laughs> Uh, I think I'd first like to start by addressing the bump in the room. Uh, I am 37 weeks pregnant with our second child. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and for those of you who haven't uh, had the joy of pregnancy, I will tell you that's very pregnant. Um, and while I'm not here to talk about that or even to talk about being a working mom, um, I will tell you that the answer to your question is yes. Yes, you can do it. Yes, it is hard. And yes, being a working mom makes, means making difficult trade-offs each and every day. And as much as I and every other parent in the world wishes that the birth of each child came with another five hours to get everything done in your day, it unfortunately does not. So what that means and the real challenge is accepting that you can't do it all. And uh, the sooner that you can come to that realization, the happier you'll be and the better you'll be both at work and at home. As is evident by the fact that I'm standing in front of you today instead of sitting on the couch, I am still struggling with this myself, <laughs> but uh, I, I, at least I know what the goal is and, and I'm working to get there. So what I am here to talk to you about today is a little bit about my own career and how I came to be buying large amounts of renewable energy and power for a tech company like Google. So to start, I'm going to take you back almost 15 years ago, and this is me receiving my college diploma. And like most college graduates at the time, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I received a degree in business and finance, and I actually went on over 100 interviews um, my senior year of college, which I don't recommend for the record. Eventually, I took a job at GE working in energy finance, and that was my tr first introduction to the power sector and to energy. And at that time, I was evaluating heat rates for coal plants and gas plants. And renewable energy was still really a blip on the radar. In fact, it was while I was at GE that they made one of their first investments uh, in, a wind, in a wind farm in Germany. And I want to share a story of a day I distinctly remember when I walked into my boss's office. And he had just returned from visiting this wind farm that had an issue with one of the turbines. And sitting behind his desk was a piece of broken wind blade. And he had actually carried this back with him on a commercial flight. And I think about that now when I go and visit wind farms, and I look up, and they have a blade span larger than a 747 airplane. And it just reminds me how far we've come, not in a technology, just in wind, but in the renewable energy industry. Uh, during my short career. So after a few years at Google, the economy was doing well, and I decided to accept a job working on Wall Street at Merrill Lynch. And I actually didn't work in the energy sector, because I thought of myself as a finance professional, and I didn't really care what industry I worked in. But what I found was that I was continuing to follow the energy trade periodicals, and I was getting really excited about the clean tech revolution that was going on at the time. And what I learned is it actually does matter what industry you work in, and you need to be passionate about it. Then one day, this happened, and Merrill Lynch was the first bank on Wall Street in the fall of 2007 to announce $5 billion of losses due to the subprime mortgage crisis. It was very shortly thereafter that they revised those estimates to $8 billion. And the amount of losses continued to grow over the next year until they hit $52 billion of losses due to the mortgage crisis. So I did what any good investment banker did at that time. I applied to business school. Uh, but before I went, I learned a valuable lesson. And that lesson was, if you had told me a few years ago that Merrill Lynch would fail as a company, I wouldn't have believed you. And even fast forwarding to today, GE was recently delisted from the Dow Jones after being a listed index company for over 100 years. And what I learned then and, and what I still know now is that there's no such thing as a safe bet or a safe company. So be sure to take risks in your career and do something that you love. So with that renewed knowledge, I went back to business school and decided I'm narrowly focusing to get back in the renewable energy sector. And something that I, I'm glad that I did while I was there, and I challenge you to do for those of you who are students, is 
I took classes in the engineering school, the undergraduate engineering school, in addition to my business score courses, because I wanted to get smart on the engineering aspect of thermodynamics and energy. And I realized that getting that technological knowledge was going to set me apart from my peers, even though I had no ambition of being an engineer after school. So two years later, I graduated into one of the worst job markets since the tech crash. Um, and it was really hard to stay focused while all of my peers were out taking any job offer that came their way. I challenged myself to stay committed to only taking those opportunities that fit what I wanted to do. And so I didn't go on 100 job interviews. In fact, I went on very few focused job interviews. And while I graduated without a job, it was not long thereafter that I was presented with two opportunities. One, to lurk, work for a large independent power producer on the East Coast, investing in renewable energy. This was the safe bet. And the other, to go work for a solar developer that was a startup company out in California. Well, much to my mother's dismay, I took the job in California. And even though I was making half as much money as I was before I went to business school, I decided to take this risk for a very specific reason. I had recognized that in an industry that is full of, of predominantly men with very tenured career in the power sector, nobody had solar experience at that time. The industry was just taking off. Wind had matured, but solar was just getting started. So if I took this job, if I came to the market where everything was happening, I would be on the same level playing field as everyone else, despite my age or lack of experience. And what I found is that that bet paid off. And I've been able to ride the solar way to precipitous cost decline and uh, exponential growth in, in solar installation. And it was about a little over two years ago that a recruiter, recruiter from Google called me. And they said, would you like to come buy energy for Google? Now, while many of you may be thinking Google is the greatest place on earth to work, why wouldn't you be excited to immediately take that job? And it is. Uh, I struggled, and actually this was the hardest career decision of my life. And the reason for that is even though you hear about these corporate PPAs, power purchase agreements today, they were still more of a novelty um, just as recently as a few years ago. And so I did my homework. And what this chart behind me shows, this is a picture actually of one of our data centers. And all a data center is, is a giant building full of rows and rows of servers or computers that are running 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And every time you go to Gmail or use Google Maps or do a Google search query, you're sending a signal to one of these servers to draw power from the grid. And so that's when it hit me that Google isn't just a technology company, it's an energy company. And in fact, we used to compare our annual energy consumption to that of the city of San Francisco. But as recently as last year, using over 7.6 terawatt hours of energy, we've had to start comparing ourselves to states, more than the state of Vermont, more than the state of Rhode Island. And that's continuing to grow <laughs> at a large pace. And so what we found is when we talk about the amount of renewables we procure, uh, we can't just compare ourselves to other tech companies or other corporations. We actually need to compare ourselves to utilities. And if we did that in 2017, we would have been the sixth largest utility in the US based on renewable procurement. And while that's awesome and the announcement that we've met 100% renewable by procuring the same number of megawatt hours from renewable assets as we use at our data centers and at Alphabet globally, we are faced with a challenge today. And that challenge is the intermittency problem of renewable energy. And what this chart behind me shows is each chart is a day and each bar is an hour and a day. And the chart on the left shows a high wind day with the red bar representing how much energy we consume. And as you can see on a high wind day, we have more than enough renewable energy to, to match our load. But the chart on the right, on a low wind day, has us pulling a lot of carbon intensive energy from the grid, and those are the black lines. And I have to tell you, we don't have the answer to this. Uh, and so I leave you today with this challenge, which is, I believe, the intermittency problem and solving for that gap when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine is the new challenge of today and is in its infancy today, much like solar was eight years ago. 
So if you're interested in this space, we're looking for smart and creative solutions for men and women to join the industry and help us solve this problem. Thank you.